It's cringeworthy. It really gets to me. Like it f***ing does my head in. And I'm part of it. You're getting this, aren't you? God, it's, you, can't, you can't put that out there. I, like that. I, get, I get into trouble. Uh, we, would, we would have these bleach parties, right? Where we get stormed off. But it was yeah. the 80s, it was cool, right? I was off doing session one. Should I or take it off? I mean, I feel comfortable in both ways. It's whatever looks good. Let me start with eyes, eyes first and hands second. So it's eyes first and hands second. No matter who's in front of me, if that hair is working in the moment and I don't physically have to touch it and visually it looks incredible and fits the narrative of what we're doing, then we stay with it. If you go in and start to get rid of those nuances and go back into being too technical and too, too much of a hairdresser in the moment, you kill it. You feel guilty sometimes that you're not doing enough. It's taken me years and years to build the confidence to get to that point for that to happen. As a session stylist, sorry, I've got something in my throat, one second. I mean, every time I work, I embrace the mistakes. I always try and do maybe something that could be potentially be a little bit simple or classic, but then how do I flip it? How do I dial up the broken element to it? There's an oddness to it. There's a broken feeling to things. And they're the things that really excite me. What I really love about hair is that it behaves differently every time I touch it, and that's magic. My pet hate in hairdressing is hair that's just overdone. There's no thought gone into it, it's just, just a head of hair to somebody. And, and I think, sadly, that's a large part of the industry. But I don't want to say that. You said it. Oh, man. It's getting in, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I don't work that's just throw away rubbish that doesn't mean anything. For me, it's about creating something that people can look at and go, they, they can connect with on, on a certain level. Like they can, it has a profound effect on you, even if you don't like it. Even if you look at it and go, mm, that's it. That's okay. Because we've, we've stirred something within you. The worst thing is, is to be remembered as somebody that just copied everybody or is boring or follows suit. I would love to change the perception of what a lot of hairdressers think good hair is. I think in this day and age, the way that we're, we're moving rapidly in other industries, I sometimes feel that the hairdressing industry, and, and I can be guilty of it like everybody else is, that we can tend to put things in boxes and we get stuck in, in, in a... I just think sometimes that the industry needs to lighten up. I think that, that they put too much in, importance on I mean it's, it's, I mean it is important it's a hard one Michael I've got to be honest with you people go he's a, he's a f so I don't want them to go oh, he's a f he is a dick don't worry we thought he was a dick but he is a dick so I've got proof now yeah. give it some edge alright alright <laughs> you're a fiend you are you look the hair and makeup team or the glam team the glam squad can ruin a shoot I've seen it happen I've seen the, the stylist disconnect with the, 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 the model or whoever it is we're working with. One of the things we talk about a lot is, is set etiquette and that's, you know, your etiquette on set. And I think vibing the model is a big part of what we do. So as a team, as a glam team, um, from the hairstylist to the makeup artist to, to, to the fashion stylist, it's how we vibe the model we're working on. And by the time they get to the photographer, they're in a great space, a great place and do a great job. Brilliant. Mike, no, no, no. Are, we, are we ready? Should, should I just talk? One of my reasons for moving to London was that growing up in the north of England was predominantly white. I think from a culture perspective, there, you know, I was really heavily into music and fashion and all of those things. And, and I felt coming to London, it was this huge melting pot of ethnicity, people's sexual orientation, you name it. You know, London was a, a place that celebrated a lot of that incredible stuff. And that was the draw for me. That was a really important aspect of why I came to London in the first place. I think hairdressers are, are great custodians of, of culture. I think, you know, it... Was that, what was the bit I was saying? Custodian of culture. I think part of our upbringing in a salon situation, for instance, is very much about 
inclusiveness because you know you you work you know you work with with gay well, straight you, black white you, you, I mean, it's, on, you've got to you, you have to get on with everybody and i think it's an inclusive industry it makes people feel safe hairdressing it's a feel-good job it's quite nice no i can't do a throwaway answer i'll have to answer it in a, a little bit yeah, in depth I've always been a, a huge advocate of the, the less retouching, the better. The most demoralizing thing is to see hair that's been retouched too heavily, where your work has been, you know, all of that natural beauty that you've left in there on purpose is destroyed by somebody thinking they, sh they need to get rid of it. And I hate to say this because it doesn't make sense because hair's dead, but hair should look alive. You want to look at that image and feel that the hair is moving, it's in the moment, there's something electric about it. But I think retouching exists in two very different worlds. I think there's a world which is about, you know, over, you know, over processed, high manipulation. There's the other side of it where I think you have a moral obligation to not retouch certain areas, which you then lose the essence of what it is you're trying to create in the first place, where you're, you're deceiving the public, you're deceiving the viewer, and you're saying that that hair or that chin is, is perfect or the nose. In this day and age, we should not be operating in that world. It's, it's unhealthy, it's dangerous. Everybody has access. You know, the, the, everybody out there really is creative to some extent. You know, a face swap and all that rubbish. And I mean, my moral responsibility on, on a set, for instance, is to find that natural essence or that natural nuance or detail or whatever you want to call it that, that the individual has and, and dial it up, make that beautiful, make that become the part that you're drawn to. Not to get rid of it, not to just put it back into a, a box of how everything should look and become formulated. It's the absolute opposite of that stuff. The sort of average person out there Things that when you talk about beauty, you've got the Kim Kardashian made up, you know, polished thing. And then they don't realise that the real people, the majority out there, are all, have all got these little individual elements of beauty. You capture that stuff on film or on set or in a still, then you're creating magic. Uh, growing up, when did you first become conscious of wanting to pursue a creative career? It wasn't until that first day in the salon. So at the age of 14, you know, I was probably like most teenagers at school where didn't really like school. In fact, hated it thinking, looking back. So my father had a friend. He suggested that to keep me out of trouble, certainly on a weekend, that I go and work in the salon. And I remember the first day walking in there thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to hate this. It's going to be dreadful. And by the end of that day, I was absolutely obsessed. All of these older girls which I was just I'd never been in the company of before and the smell and the, these fabulous hairstylists that were dressed imma immaculate and then the music I mean the whole theatre of it was incredible and I knew there and then that I, my profession in life was being a professional hairdresser Brilliant. and it's a true story then there was the obsession with Anthony yeah. I mean I can tell you this great thing about he, he goes oh f yeah, no, doesn't like him so let's do that even with that <laughs> I mean, we did a live thing from here and it was like, I was a bit embarrassed. Yeah. But then they were like, oh, we love the trains going on, it was amazing. I was like, okay, all right. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I was working for Saks in, in the Northeast. I was working with a guy called Gary Hooker. And we went down to this event in London, which was, which is Sun International. Seeing Anthony on stage with the team, a Tony and Guy, it was just going into a whole different way of thinking about hair. Whereas up until that point, it was about making people look beautiful. This was looking at it in a slightly anarchistic, cool, fashion-driven, punk way, if you like. They were just the coolest looking hairdressers. But Anthony Muscola was at the helm of it. And I thought, I've got to be part of this. I, I need to join that. Everybody wanted to be part of it. It was, it was the biggest thing in hairdressing by far. So my obsession then became, how do I come to work for those people? This is my destiny. Fast forward to that point in, in 2003, 2004. This was the, the, the birth, if you like, of the Bedhead Studios. A situation where Anthony and Pat, I suppose, had been in charge of such a, a, a juggernaut, a machine, if you like, at Tony and Guy, to a very humble situation in that studio in Battersea. You know, we looked up to Anthony and Pat as the ultimate creative couple. You know, there's that family thing in the team. 
literally four or five of us in there, really starting to learn how do we create really cool imagery which is accessible, but how does that then relate back into the business? So I think it was that in itself was really, really special. Cool. We didn't answer that. I mean, this last year with the pandemic globally has been a nightmare for, you know, for, for hairdressers around the world. But I think creatively, some of my best work I've done has been in this period. I think spiritually, I've sort of connected in a, in a very different way with some of the work that I do. Having time to sort of stand back and appreciate these very simple things in life that could change on, you know, the drop of a hat. Um, sorry. No worries, don't worry. Do we do ask some more questions? Different questions? Well, I was watching people online and, and where they were cutting and colouring their own hair. And I thought there's an idea in this. But when I was a kid in the 80s, we would sort of have these bleach parties, we'd bleach each other's hair, you know, get drunk. And... But then talking to like a mate of mine, Eugene, a hairstylist, and he was saying about, you know, if you look back at the whole punk thing and how the punks would colour their hair, but this process would become part of their look and who they are. So I think without COVID, that would have never happened. So, you know, this situation of necessity, something creatively came out of it. Reynolds, okay, cool, cut for a second. Three most important hairdressers. The three most important hairdressers in my life, in my career, is definitely Anthony Mascolo, because I wouldn't be aware of is the, the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable, it's crap. It's like he's gonna go away, he's gonna say, that place is no good for doing anything. So the three most important hairdressers, one is Anthony Mascolo. I wouldn't be where I am today without Anthony. You know, he gave me the opportunities to, to be able to get to this point where I'm in my career. The second would be Julian Deese. People sometimes, is this question of, is, is hair art? And I think he is a true artist in every sense. And I think the hairdresser's hairdresser that ticks every box for me and really has changed, changed the game over the years is Eugene Suleiman. Um, Eugene is not only a great friend and somebody that I really look up to, but I think every season, whether he's creating something for the, for the designers he's working with, just does something which I think I've never seen that before. And that is just magic.